Hi friends, my name is Tris, and this is No Boilerplate, where I make fast, technical videos. Today I'm going to explain my framework for thinking about AI tools, what they're great at, what they're not so good at, why they don't live up to their claims, and what to do about that. So, Apple Intelligence has been out for a couple of months now, but like a lot of AI promises, it's fallen a little short, right? The AI hype train is driven by the tantalizing promise of AGI, general intelligence, like we see in the movies. Maria, Hal, Marvin, Johnny Five, C-3PO, Rachel and Deckard, Holly, Jarvis and Wally. But despite four years of promises, Apple Intelligence is the latest example of these products missing the mark. The best two things that Marquez here has to say about Apple Intelligence are one, the background eraser tool is pretty good, and two, it has bumped up the base RAM across all of Apple's hardware lineup. This is well overdue, as I mentioned in my video on the unreasonable effectiveness of Linux workstations. CNET did not hold back on their criticism either. Apple Intelligence was announced at WWDC in June 2024, but didn't ship with the brand new iPhones and the other hardware that was announced then. Only after months were these strangely mediocre features released to us. The really good stuff is coming, we are promised, and I believe we have heard that before. My video scripts are dedicated to the public domain. Everything you see here, script links and images, are part of a markdown document available freely on GitHub at the above address. Part 1. Language is important. To understand what is happening with AI, let us tighten up our definitions and give credit to what does work well. Artificial intelligence is a large discipline, containing many fields with applications that are already so well integrated with our tools that we forget about them. Searching our photos by the contents of the photo instead of file name or date is AI. Near perfect, at least in English, voice recognition is AI. Generative fill for editing out unwanted parts of images is also AI. These features are all AI tools, but we don't typically call them that. Like when alternative medicine is proved to work, we call it medicine. When AI tech works, we stop calling it AI. It fades into the background of our normal computing. This video is about generative AI, large language models, and GPT, the technologies that the companies promise much with, but deliver surprisingly little. Large language models like ChatGPT are great at comprehending language. For instance, I've never seen such a great thesaurus. You can just describe the feeling you want to convey and get 10 reasonable words or phrases back, but start to use it for knowledge, not language, and you get into trouble. ChatGPT4 got this question partially wrong, and so did Claude at the time of writing. Gemini got the right answer, a harpsichord, but did not also identify the second instrument, a mellotron, which ChatGPT did. The more specific the answers you want, the less reliable large language models are. It reminds me of the demon cat from Adventure Time, which has approximate knowledge of many things. It's very confident, but often inaccurate. This trend exists across all the GPT tools I have tested, from cloud providers such as OpenAI, to running and tweaking my own local models with Olama. But that's fine, there's so much value on the left side of this graph. For initial research and shallow exploration, you can absolutely use a GPT tool to quickly find areas you want to look into deeper for yourself. However, there are real limits in these generative techniques that you come up against very soon after you start using them for complex work. Let's talk about where these limits come from and how to avoid them. It's just me running this channel and I'm so grateful for everyone for supporting me on this wild adventure. If you'd like to see and give feedback on my videos up to a week early, as well as get private Discord access and even your name in the credits, it would be very kind of you to check my Patreon. I'm also offering a limited number of mentoring slots. If you'd like one-to-one -one tuition on personal organization, Rust, creative production, web tech, or anything that I talk about in my videos, do sign up and let's chat. Part two, the magic beans don't work because they don't have to. GPT is a marvel of natural language processing. Autocorrect that is trained on the whole internet can almost always offer sensible suggestions about what should come next in a sentence. But language ability, as we learned in Star Wars, does not equal intelligence. The problem is that we are extremely language-centric creatures, and we mistake language proficiency for intelligence, which causes us to misuse this technology, or for this technology to misuse us. You're not chatting to an intelligent agent, it's auto-completing your questions, like a sociopath getting under your skin by saying what it thinks you want to hear. Large language models can only learn topics where there is a large amount of language available to train them. For example, the reason LLMs can't autocomplete maths is because, apart from trivial examples, the state space of all numbers is too great to expect much existing training data. 
Contrast how often 1 plus 1 equals 2 is written in textbooks, easy for ChatGPT to complete, with how often, say, 2e squared plus 5j equals 0 is. One of these has a large amount of existing natural language data available for training, one does not. This is why tools like ChatGPT seem good at first when you ask it simple questions, but as you dig deeper, they fall apart and get increasingly inaccurate or hit artificial guardrails and only provide surface level responses. It's not that the technology is new and will eventually get better, it's that this incredible language ability can only work after being trained on large amounts of data. By definition, there might be only a single PhD written about a very niche topic, so GPT will never learn that information, because a single PhD paper is not a large amount of language. And if you don't have a large amount of language, you can't train a large language model. AI companies can't fulfill their wild promises, so why do they make them? Part 3. We are not the audience. I was confused by the distance between the hype and reality until I realised we're not the audience for all this breathless hype. As I've shown, if you take the claims at face value, these technologies simply don't work. And things that don't work can't solve problems. And you can't sell someone something that doesn't solve their problem. Not twice, anyway. So why do the companies keep making these promises? Well, it's not demand from the customers, nor direction from the engineers, nor even really by choices made by their CEOs. It's because the real decision makers in these companies are their wealthy investors. Broken or mediocre AI tools that we all hate have been crammed into everything we use, now even our notifications, because the companies have to impress investors with AI features, even if they don't work well. When you work in tech startups, as I have over the past 15 years, you get to know the startup runway very well. I wasn't always, as a lowly engineer, privy to the actual amount of funding coming in and salaries going out each month, but we would all be able to feel when the end of the runway was in sight. You can typically extend your runway in two main ways. One, selling products and services to users for money. Or two, persuading investors to part with more of their money. Selling products is hard. They have to work. But selling a promise? That's easy. Plus a change, perhaps. I'm not so sure. It feels different this time with AI. Gen AI is this perfect tool for tricking investors out of their money because, often enough, the people asking for the money and their customers think it works too. LLMs are great at basic stuff, and in the past, when a computer could automate basic tasks to a good degree, it only required time, improvements, and of course money to perfect. As an investor, surely you'd better get in on the ground floor of this marvellous new technology, just as you have before. What can I conclude from this? From colonies on Mars to democratising money, it's always easier to promise a bright future than build a better present. What I remind myself to do, whenever I see these bizarre products that no one needs, is to pay less attention to what these companies say their tech will do in the future, and far more to what they actually can do today. Thank you. If you would like to support my channel, get early ad-free and tracking-free videos, your name in the credits, or one-to-one -one mentoring, head to my Patreon or Ko-fi. If you're interested in transhumanism and hope punk, please check out my weekly sci-fi audio fiction podcast, Lost Terminal. Season 2 of the Phosphine Catalogue is broadcasting now. If you like mysteries and art, check it out. Transcripts and compiled checked markdown source code are available on GitHub, links in the description, and corrections are in the pinned errata comment. Thank you so much for watching. Talk to you on Discord.